Welcome to Garden City Church, a place where you can belong before you believe. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Tanika and I'm the new groups director here at Garden City. Today, George shares about five fractures of evangelicalism. If you would like to partner with us, you can like and subscribe, share this video with a friend or someone who would love to hear the message, or you can partner with us financially. We're so thankful you joined us today. Let's get into the word with George. We've been talking about shifts within culture and the church. Recently, I've been talking with friends about this. One friend said, I see fracturing in the church. Um, I've had friends move to Texas where they could be with more like-minded people. I don't know about you, but maybe you've experienced that. I had another person say, why, is, why does it seem like the church is so tribal right now, so tribalized. It seems like people are moving to different places, uh, geographically moving to different churches. There just seems to be so much tribalism, and uh, maybe you've noticed that as well, and I don't think you're wrong in noticing that. In fact, here's a quote from uh, a leader at Christianity Today. New fractures are forming within the American evangelical movement, fractures that do not run along the usual regional denominational ethnic or political lines, couples, families, friends, congregations, once united in their commitment to Christ, are now dividing over seemingly irreconcilable views of the world. In fact, they are not merely dividing, but becoming incomprehensible to one another. You ever been at a meal where people are just like talking over each other, talking at each other, and they're not hearing each other, not, they're not even understanding, like the, the words they're using, are they're, they're not translating. Michael Graham writes, the tectonic plates are shifting underfoot. This fracturing will likely be irrevocable, not because our gospel essentials are not unifying enough, but because the divergence, ethical priorities, cultural engagement, racial attitudes, and political visions and illusions. We live in a world that draws lines of division between people and we're living in a more fractured world, especially within the church right now. How can we learn to draw circles of love and mercy around each other rather than lines of division? Today, I'd like to look at five fractures within the faith community right now. And then I'd like to look at the fractures and tensions in Jesus' world and how he dealt with that. Here's a paradigm I want to offer you to help us understand some of the fractures happening within the church. Um, this is based off of a paradigm um, that was written about by Michael Graham with Schuyler, Schuyler Flowers in an article called The Six-Way Fracturing of Evangelicalism. So I would refer you to look um, at that if you want to go deeper into this paradigm. In the article, they talk about six fractures, um, six fault lines that are happening between uh, Christians and evangelicals. Um, I've reduced it to five, and I want to talk about these as perspectives. I don't want to categorize you or feel like you're getting thrown into a bucket. These are just perspectives that might help us understand our, our world a little bit better right now. So let's talk about these perspectives one through five. The first perspective uh, Michael Graham calls neo-fundamentalist evangelicalism. This is the neo-fundamentalist evangelical perspective. Now, he wrote those words, not, not me. But um, this is a perspective um, where uh, Christians within the church uh, come from, um, are more comfortable with national political uh, links with their faith, uh, more comfortable with conservative po political figures and political forms of power and allegiance within the church. Um, concerning threats within the church, they have deep worries about the church's drift towards liberalism and, and the way secular ideologies are finding homes within the church. Outside the church, ones are more concerned by the culture's increasingly hostile um, stance toward uh, faith or their faith in Christianity, and most predominantly from mass media, social media, and from the government. These are some of their concerns. Now, the second perspective Graham calls mainstream evangelical. The emphasis for this group is on fulfilling the Great Commission. They're concerned often with threats from within the church. They share a degree of concern for the secular rights influence on Christianity, including the destructive pull of Christian nationalism. But often they have a little bit more concern about the secular left's influence and the desire to assimilate 
uh, since the world still remains so hostile. They don't want the church to just assimilate to the world. Now, outside the church, they're likely uncomfortable with the rhetoric political conservative leaders use, but they view this direction as maybe the lesser of two evils. Perspective number three, Graham calls neo-evangelical. This perspective has people view themselves a little bit more as like global evangelicals, and they're doctrinally evangelical, but maybe they no longer use the term evangelical in some circumstances, especially in the American context, as the term has become like an identifier that has evolved to be more political and theological from their perspective. And within the church, they're highly concerned about conservative Christianity's acceptance of conservative political extremism and failure to engage on topics of race and sexuality in helpful and constructive ways. But they've not totally abandoned evangelical identification and likely still labor in churches with the broadest spectrum of these groups. Outside the church, this group feels largely homeless in today's world. They have um, an equal concern, or maybe they lean one way or the other, depending on who they are. They get concerned about the extremes um, posing a threat to Christians who actually seek to live peaceful, serving, quiet lives within the culture. Perspective number four, Graham calls this post-evangelical. Now, this perspective is more deconstructed than neo-evangelicals, number three, and they're more vocal in their critiques of ones, twos, than threes would be. Now, some remain firmly in the Protestant circle or Protestant circles, and others have crossed over to mainline Catholic or even Orthodox traditions while still holding to the basic creeds. Concerning threats within the church, they are focused on abuse, abuse of power, corruption, hypocrisy, Christian nationalism, the secular right. Outside the church, they're primarily concerned with the matters of injustice, inequity, the secular right, and to a lesser extent, the radical secular left. Many fours are fours because their experience with predominantly white evangelicalism has been so difficult and strained that physical distance may seem to be the only conclusion for them. Perspective five, this is deconverted or de-churched. I'd say this this perspective has a lot of non-religious or people who have left the church and are completely deconverted with no vestiges of Christian beliefs. Now, after hearing all five of those perspectives, and again, this is imperfect. It's just a model. It's just a paradigm to help us have some language. But what perspective do you identify with most? As you were listening to those different perspectives, one through five, what perspectives do you see in family and friends? Is there a perspective that rubs you the wrong way, maybe just bugs you? Sometimes naming our perspective helps us heal the fractures and the lines that we have drawn or just be, become aware of them. According to Michael Graham in his article, ones and fours these days, in these polarized days, likely don't share faith communities. Ones and threes tend to bug each other. Twos and fours tend to bug each other. And fives are kind of bugged by everybody. (laughs) Now, I know we're making some generalizations, but uh, this is what I've learned through this article. And I'm seeing some of these fault lines. Do you feel the fault lines? Do you feel some of these fractures? This might even feel like uh, Thanksgiving dinner for for some of us. (laughs) There might be one through five all around the table having conversations, and you can feel some of the fault lines. And some family members uh, and some families have experienced division where they don't have uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas together in the last few years because of this. And unfortunately, it's the same in our families of faith. Now, having spoken with people who may be going through some forms of deconstruction, Uh, maybe in perspectives three or four. Uh, Before the pandemic, some of these people coming from this perspective thought they were going to a church that was like maybe in the three range, maybe in the two. But then when the pandemic hit, it really revealed that they were going to a church with with, uh, leadership that was centered on like a a one perspective or 1.5. And so they hit the ejector seat. They freaked out. Like, what? I didn't realize I was going to that I thought it was this. Or you'll ha- you would have vice versa. You'd have people who thought they were, um, who maybe identified as ones and twos uh, from their perspective, 
um, when the pandemic hit, uh, their church started using perspective language and leadership that was like felt like a three or four to them, and that freaked them out. The the pandemic had a very revealing effect, didn't it, on some of these fault lines? So how do we deal with these tribal lines in the church? I don't think they're just going to go away by themselves. How do we love and accept people but also hold on to our convictions? Can we do that? How do we hold the tensions of diversity without destroying unity or destroying diversity, depending on how you lean? Biggest question is, who gets to decide who's in and who's out and who gets to lead and who doesn't? How do we deal with this? I want to look right now at some of the fractures and the tensions in Jesus' world to maybe learn from him how we can deal with the fractures within uh, the, the body of faith. In Matthew chapter 9, it says this, as Jesus continued on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a kiosk for collecting taxes. He's a tax collector. He said to him, hey, follow me. And he got up and he followed Jesus. As Jesus sat down to eat in Matthew's home, his house, many tax collectors and sinners joined Jesus and his disciples at the table. I love that. Many tax tax collectors who were hated because they were seen as like people who were cheating their own countrymen out of of money. They were seen as colluding with a foreign government that was controlling them. Uh, they They were not well liked. Jesus it's at Matthew's house with many tax collectors and sinners, so other types of variety of sinners. Um, and Jesus and his disciples were right in the middle of that at the table. I love that image. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to Jesus' disciples, they didn't say directly to Jesus, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with these tax collectors and all these sinners? Why are you all at the table together? This doesn't make sense. Don't you see the fractures? Don't you see the fault lines? Don't you see the lines here in the tribal, the tribes that are here? Verse 12, when Jesus heard it, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Go and learn what this means. I want mercy and not sacrifice. I didn't come to call the righteous, but to call sinners. I came for this table. I came for the people here. I'm inviting them and you. Jesus came for you. He came for me and came for all those people that we can't stand because everyone's a sinner according to another person's perspective. You see, like you're, you have a, a grid, a filter that you look at the world at, and it might be like, oh, the 49er fans are sinners because I'm a Seahawks fan. Or if you're a 49er fan, you see Seahawks fans as sinners. And when it comes to politics, there's a sinner according to your filter. When it comes to culture, there are sinners according to your filter. We all have this filter. But Jesus would say to us, just like he says to the Pharisees who are drawing all these lines, go and learn what this means. I want mercy, not sacrifice. Jesus wants us to draw circles of mercy and love, not lines of judgment and exclusion. Think of all the people in the rooms and the parties that Jesus had, all the people around the tables that Jesus ate with throughout his ministry. Think of the tensions, the lines, the fractures that Jesus had to live in. Here's just a few people that may have been at those parties, those tables, those moments. John the Baptist, a prophet who did a lot of his work outside of culture, you know, didn't drink wine. He, you know, it's probably pretty awkward with him and some of the disciples who didn't have a problem with engaging culture and drinking wine. Nicodemus was likely a a Pharisee, a a religious elite, a political ruling elite. Matthew, we already know about him. He was a tax collector who worked for the, the Roman government before following Jesus. Then there's Simon the Zealot, who was part of a group that rebelled and fought against the Roman government. You think there's some tension between him and Matthew? Then you have the Roman centurion, He's a Roman military commander. He's on the wrong team, the wrong side. And you even have Jesus allowing uh, this Samaritan woman, we often know as the woman at the well, who is a Samaritan enemy. And Jesus is right in the center of this room, around this table with these types of people all throughout his ministry. Look at all that attention. Like, think about that. Can you feel it? Matthew's party wouldn't be possible without Jesus. 
These people I mentioned and many more could never have been in the same community without Jesus. You know what that means? This community of tribes and fractures and difference was a miracle only made possible by Jesus being in the room. Without Jesus, this party doesn't happen. None of these people are together. There are people you would never choose to be here and here and here in the same room around the same table if Jesus hadn't invited them, if he hadn't brought them into the party. So how do we look at Jesus' world that was just as fractured, if not more, than ours, and how do we how do we live into that? How do we transcend all these differences and fractures and learn to choose partnership with each other for the kingdom of God rather than partisanship? How do we center our life in a different way that, that doesn't live with all the lines? We're going to dig into this, especially next week, but I just want to leave us with this key statement from Jesus. He said to the religious leaders who are like seeing all the lines, all the fractures, and like, why are these sinners here? He said, go and learn what this means. I want mercy, not sacrifice. And sacrifice in this context is, you know, like it's judgment, it's separation. The word Pharisee means to separate. And so there's two equations at work that are at at opposition and and pushing up against each other in, in this party, in this room, in this moment, and I think even in our world today. And here's what it is. Tension plus judgment equals separation, equals the fractures and the fault lines and the running to different corners of the room, different corners of the country, different churches. Tension plus, tension plus judgment equals separation. But Jesus teaches us tension plus mercy equals transformation, mutual transformation, that we can actually all be transforming each other. Still holding our convictions, still understanding there's brokenness in me and blind spots in me and things that are wrong, and, but, but we can negotiate that and transcend those differences when we realize that tension plus mercy equals transformation. Jesus invites us to the table of difference, different tribes, different uh, groups, different ways of thinking, us uh, against them kind of thinking, but he invites us to move away from this us versus them mentality to us for them. Jesus invites us to this beautiful, radical inclusion uh, and partnership in the kingdom of God, but still being able to recognize our difference. We know in our hearts we need more partnership, less partisanship. We know that the left hand and the right hand work best when they're working together. I think one of the, the, the central questions that comes up is how do we allow diversity of people to come into the room together without letting their shadow or their idol lead? Their idol is is like whenever we turn a good thing into a God thing. And at Garden City, our goal is to keep Jesus at the center, not the idols that each of us may bring in, the blind spot, the greed, the religiosity, the political party, or the political leader that that you know different people might want to set at the center of the room. We always want to remember that when Jesus is in the room, tension and mercy can actually mutually transform us into the likeness of Christ. And so we keep Jesus at the center of the room. When we take Jesus out of the center, Tension, judgment lead to separation and fracture. So friends, fracture lines are dividing people in the church right now, turning brothers and sisters into enemies, turning uh, tribes into enemy tribes, focusing on, on, on who's in and who's out. How can we be agents of mercy and peace? How can we follow Jesus uh, as a peacemaker in such polarized time? Next week, we're going to be looking at some different ways Jesus in the ancient church teaches us to draw circles of love and mercy rather than lines of control and condemnation. And we are going to explore key practices that keep us Jesus-centered as a diverse community, um, not self-centered as a community, and helps us center on Jesus, not the blind spots and the shadows and maybe the idols that each of us might want to bring into the room. We're going to submit to Jesus and we're going to learn together how we can be a force for peace in the world. Guys, bring a friend. It's going to be a really important conversation. I love you so much. See you next week. Love is patient